So we're starting off IBC 2017 with a familiar face. Hello, Mr. Newton. Me hide. No. Hello. How are you doing? Yeah, all right. I tried to find. No. Tried to get away from you, but I just can't. You just can't stay away, can you? I'm, I'm just. I'm everywhere. Now I'm interviewing you as a expert. Really? Yeah, in professional capacity for a change. Okay. You're on the other side of the fence. That wasn't in the brief, but okay, fine. And the reason we're here is because of this. Now, you have shot quite a lot with this recently, here and also in Dubai. I have indeed. So I've just finished a shoot for Canon Europe with the C200, and about five, six weeks ago, I did a shoot in Dubai for Canon UAE, uh, again with C200, just to show people what it can do to put it through its paces uh, and see how, see how I got on with it, really. Now, anybody that watches our little uh, adventures will know that if we cut you in half, then basically you, you are canon all through. So you're bound to be a little bit biased. However, it would just be interesting to know what it's actually like practically. One is assuming it's typical canon, get it out of the box, strap the lens on, and away you go. Was it that easy? Are there things that you think they've really got nailed? What were your thoughts on it? First thoughts are that I, I really like the compact shape and size. I mean, I've used C100, I've used C300. If you've used any Canon camera, and actually even for people that are coming from DSLR, the menus, the layout, the buttons all seem to make sense. It's, it really is a take camera out of box and you can pretty much go shooting with it. There's a few things that you need to understand a little bit about RAW and what that gives you, but fundamentally it's a very simple camera to get your head around to take out and to actually start shooting with. And it's very easy to rig. So here at the show, we've got it rigged. Um, this is on a, a Vocus shoulder rig, but you can also take the camera and stick it on a gimbal. And that means it can also go onto a drone as well. So it's a very riggable, very usable bit of kit. In terms of my favorite features, uh, controversially, I love the autofocus. I work in a, in a way where I, I like shooting on my own or with a very small crew. I don't want to have to have a focus puller with me and I know the unions are going to get all upset about that, but I want to be able to control everything and I, I want to be able to work often on my own and autofocus makes that possible and it, it's one of the features I think they've absolutely nailed. You can use it or not and if you're going to use it with the autofocus it tracks brilliantly. If you want to turn it off and you're going to go manual or you're maybe using one of the one of the Cine Primes which don't have autofocus, you've got beautiful focus assist. So you can select any point on the screen because the screen itself is a touch screen, which makes selecting focus points really easy. Um, and you can see with two little arrows whether you're front or back focused and therefore adjust your focus accordingly. It makes for a very usable, very easy to understand and very flexible system. So there's two points there I want to pick up on. First of all, touch screen. Now, that's the first on these, isn't it? it is, We've it had is. these on the SLRs for last year or so, um, but this is the first for these type of cameras. It is indeed, and, and the thing I, I should probably point out is it's touchscreen for focus, it's not touchscreen for going through menus. So when you go through the menus, you're on buttons and, and the little joysticks, but the focus is touchscreen controlled and it works really nicely. Another point is, unlike the C300 Mark II and the C100 Mark II, the focus area on this for the dual AF is much bigger, isn't it? It is. It covers an awful lot more of the frame. So you've got a lot more flexibility in terms of your composition. If you've got very much off-center subjects, you can still get a focus point onto them. And if you had, for example, um, I don't know, a static situation, interview situation with two people, kind of a bit like this, I guess, and you wanted to have a focus point on each of them and then move between, you can pull up a second focus point with the focus assist, and then you can just focus pull between them it does make it really usable. Yeah, so uh, obviously the dual AF, I think we're all starting to come around to the idea that you actually don't have to manually focus lenses. Speaking of lenses, what lenses did you use on it? Because obviously we've got the 1880 here, but did you use normal photo lenses as well with it? Yep, I've used a whole variety. So I've used most of the Cine Primes um, from 14 to 135. I've also used things like 2470 f4, 70 to 2528, 85-18, um, 5185, doesn't matter whether it's Cine or whether it was a, an EF lens, they've worked just the same. And how did you get on, I mean obviously when you were out in Dubai, out in the Middle East, you got issues with sand and everything else, how did you get on with it coping with the environment? It was fine actually, I covered it in sand and then on my shoot last week I covered it in powder paint and in both cases the camera's been fine. The thing that I was concerned about, obviously you've got your exhaust vents, these have got to be kept cool somehow because it gets warm in there and I was really concerned that sand or paint or whatever would get in there, maybe cause a problem, 
Not an issue at all. Certainly not in my use. Okay, other thing, low lights. What's it like with low light? Really surprised. In Dubai, particularly, I used the low light. Over here, it was shot during the day, but in Dubai, I did some shooting quite late at night, um, and I tried it up to 21,000-ish ISO. Um, in fact, I, I know, it was probably about as far as I went. And it was surprisingly good, really surprisingly good. And everyone that's seen it has commented that, you know, because it was ambient light only, how clean that looks for such a high ISO. Okay. Uh, now, there is a slight elephant, not in this room, but overall regards this that everybody's question, and that is in terms of the codex, where you've kind of got one at one end and you've got one at the other end in terms of the raw and the more basic codex. And there doesn't seem to be anything in the middle. Now, sort of the million dollar question that everybody's asking is fine, okay, so then we have to use this raw light. But actually, is it usable or does it mean you just basically get through memory sticks like you, you're out of, they're going out of fashion? You've then got processing time, transcoding time. It, what were the practicalities when you actually really had to use it? So I think certainly raw creates some conundrums that you need to overcome. It's a data issue. And the, the way to think of it is that this camera is very future-proofed, okay? We've got a camera that's, you know, in two years' time, dealing with RAW 4K is going to be so much easier. For now, we had um, shooting 4K RAW 50 frame a second about 15 to 16 minutes on a 128 gig CFast card. So it's a lot of data you're going to generate very quickly. Um, that's something to be aware of. In terms of the processing, it's a time thing. We've got a couple of ways of processing. So natively, we can go into DaVinci Resolve, or we can go into the Canon software, Canon RAW Development Tool. That's actually slightly better if you want to get more dynamic range, because through Log2, that's going to give you up to 15 stops of dynamic range. And that, for anyone that's come from a stills background, should be familiar, because it's basically like DPP, but for videos. Okay, You take your file, which is raw. You're going to add it into your media pool. You're going to make your adjustments. So you've got white balance. You've got sharpness. Um, you've got brightness and then you're going to export it and yes you're going to hit go and let it run for a while because it will take some time um, but once that's done you then take it like any other file and drop it into whatever you want to edit in any NLE will deal with it at that point as I say the only way you can deal with it natively is currently through Resolve but we know that Adobe are working on it Final Cut are working on it there will be more native NLE systems dealing with the, the raw footage you know our customers how do you think this will sit with them in terms of where it sits alongside the C100 and the C300? So this camera is a real kind of, um, it's, it's a two-headed beast, okay? You can either take the very high-end codec, the 4K RAW, and do your really creative stuff where you want high production value, lots of great ability, or you can take that lower codec that everyone's saying, oh, why have we got this low thing and this high thing and nothing in the middle? And you can go and do your weddings, your events, your solo shooting, where you don't need as much great ability. You don't want the data that you're going to get off 4K RAW. You want something that's light, easy to use, easy to rig, quick to deal with. And by configuring the camera through the menus, you can get stuff coming out in your codec, in your low-res codec, low-res in inverted commas, that actually looks good straight out of the camera. So you've got something that will sit between both camps very easily. And if you want to go really high-end, and take this into a full production, it's the same sensor as a C700, and it's the same stack height as a C700. So you could switch this out. If you rig up for a C700, you could take that out, you could drop this in. You can move between those two cameras without having to re-rig, move your lens axis around any of that jazz. So I think it's a camera that steps across a lot of boundaries, a lot of areas of use. And for me, I, I, I would take this as my one camera to do everything in the Canon range at the moment. That's interesting, even from you. Excellent, I'd better leave you to actually do some work now, I suppose. Thank you. Thanks, Dave.